Okay. Uh, so thanks so much for being here with us today. Yeah, Wojtek and I are from Open Media. We have Josh here too, he's our campaigns coordinator, and Glenn, who does a lot of community engagement work with us. And we run mass mobilization campaigns to keep the internet open and affordable, and to preserve your rights to privacy and free expression online. So we do that largely through online campaigning, uh, which can sometimes be seen as a little bit of a kind of slacktivist art, where we just get people to do things that are super easy, um, and then that don't really mean a lot and don't really resemble the kind of traditional advocacy that we're used to. So our challenge has been trying to make that advocacy really effective and also trying to make sure that as a couple of essentially paid activists, we don't become completely disconnected from the community that we're meant to serve, follow and lead, um, and that we are really in touch with what people actually want to see from us. So part of the way that we've tried to systematize that kind of process of going from just having someone's email address to doing the kind of really highly involved, highly engaged stuff that Linda was talking about this morning is through a model called the engagement pyramid that tries to kind of break it down and systematize it. Uh, so we're starting to try to think through how we can actually look at people in our organization as part of one cohesive whole, but having really different ways of engaging with us, making sure that all those ways are really meaningful. So this is the kind of classic engagement pyramid. Uh, it was developed by Groundwire. You can find a lot of stuff about it online if you're interested. You can see it goes from observing at the lowest level, where most of your people will be clustered, all the way right up to owning. It's a model that's used in lots of different organizations, so you can really adapt it for your own needs. This is one that was for a, a library, so you can see they thought about people who just use the study space, all the way up to people who do advocacy or partnership with the library. And at Open Media, we've really taken this and we've tried to adapt it for our own needs. Um, so as I said, we have an email list of about 700,000 people. A lot of those people fall into the category of observing. Uh, where our goal with them is just to inspire initial and repeat contact with our organization. Their awareness of us is the major factor that makes them observers in our pyramid. And their actions are things like visiting our website or maybe coming to an event. Uh, on the second level up, where we're trying to move people is endorsing. So there we want to earn enough of their trust to be able to secure an endorsement of our work. Their trust and their time are the major factors in their engagement with us. And their actions include things like petition signing or sharing. So they're comfortable with the idea that their name is going to be connected to our work. That's already a big thing. One level up from that is contributing. So that's where people are deepening their commitment to our mission, to our work. Their time, their money, and for us, their insight are the major factors. Their actions might include donating, they might include contributing input to crowdsource policies or submissions. So this is where open media is very unique. Not many other organizations look at the contributing level as a place where people are contributing insight. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we actually do that. So we're fighting a trade deal called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It contains a lot of internet censorship provisions that really shouldn't be in the trade deal. It's being negotiated in a very anti-democratic way. There's really no citizen consultation. So we built a tool that asks people at that contributing level of our pyramid to tell the negotiators of the TPP what they would like them to hear, what kinds of things matter to them. So it's a lot of things like, I'm a teacher and under the TPP it would be much more difficult for me to share electronic materials. And then we take those comments and we sneak into the negotiating room, in this case just into the lobby of the hotel, and we broadcast them on the wall to try and get their voices in heard in the process. So these people who've submitted their comments to us, they're really thoughtful, there's about 15,000 of them, we consider them to be contributing. Uh, they're not contributing money, but they're contributing their insights about why the TPP is going to be harmful for internet users. Then we take all those comments that those people have submitted to us that we've gone and projected onto the wall or passed around on an iPad and inside of the negotiating room, um, and we did content analysis of these, and we used the comments to build what we call a drag and drop crowdsourcing tool where people can actually say what their priorities are for copyright law, and then they can rank some of the ideas that people have shared with us and with the negotiators about ways that copyright should actually look different in the digital age. So these are some ways that we've tried to make that contributing level about guiding our work, giving us really meaningful insight, and creating kind of a plan from our community that we, as their advocates, can be held accountable to. Uh, on level four, that's where we're looking at developing people's potential to lead others in our campaigns. So the key factors are that people at this level engage others and they have a deep understanding of our campaigns. 
So people on this level, they become shared leaders. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. They also write letters to the editor. So we have a tool that allows people to write letters to the editor of their local paper about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Or they join things like an under-the-hood uh, internet town hall. So we had a kind of Google Hangout where people could learn some of the really like deep details about this campaign. So if you become a share leader, what that means is you've taken our, you've used our crowdsourcing drag and drop tool that I showed you on the previous slide. You've said what you think copyright should look like in a digital age. Probably looks very different from what's in the TPP. Almost nobody who takes our survey says that they think copyright should last for 100 years after the death of the creator. That's what's currently proposed in this trade deal. So you've done this, this, you've taken this crowdsourcing survey, and then at the end of it, you're given a unique URL. And if you share that with other people, you can join this leaderboard. So the people at the top of this leaderboard, the share leaders, are people who've had many other people take the survey using their own unique URL. And when the survey wraps in about a month or so, there's going to be a prize for these guys. So we're looking at ways that, uh, in, in purely digital ways, we can actually empower others to lead. At level five, we have owning. And that looks pretty different for us, especially for some reasons that Wojtek's going to get into. Um, but uh, for us, the way that we've designed our pyramid, at level five, uh, you actually feel like you own Open Media's work and its mission. So you have an organizational, not a campaign-specific commitment. So you understand Open Media as an organization that's independent from an individual campaign to fight the TPP or fight Bill C-30 um, or protect your privacy online. You get the kind of mission of our work. Uh, so people at that level, they've joined what we call a digital action team. Uh, they might volunteer in person, or they become a monthly donor, which is a really significant commitment to open media. So this is what our this is a kind of representation of this uh, pyramid for one of our campaigns, the one that I've just been talking about on free expression or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And one of the things that you'll notice that's super important here is we have a staff member's name beside each of the different groups in our pyramid of engagement. So somebody is tagged to actually figure out who those people are and what the next steps are going to be for them to move up. So this is super important to actually being able to implement this model. Looking at who's responsible. But the thing is, uh, what I've presented to you right now requires a fair amount of tracking. So you actually do need to be paying attention to where people are moving. So this is a representation of the growth in the campaign from one week to the next in the month of September, so it shows where people moved on the pyramid. Uh, and if you don't track that, then the model is obviously much less effective. Uh, so this is a, just a representation of where we went from September to November. You can see there's some, been some really significant growth, like 100,000, or no, about 90,000 in endorsing. Um, as of May 8th, we had 299,000 people endorsing, about 42,000 people contributing, 12,000 leading, and about 3,000 owning. So the numbers are, are quite significant. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues is that what I've shown you so far is actually just a triangle, yeah. right? Um, but Open Media works on more than just the free expression issue. We work on several different issues at once. So this is where we get into, I mean, this has already been a level of complexity, but we're about to get into like where, where it gets really, really interesting and really cool and sophisticated, um, and where we actually start to see this become a pyramid or mountain. So I'm going to pass it over to Wojtek for that. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. Um, so as, as Ryan mentioned, we did a great job, I think, with sort of trying to implement the pyramid scheme onto one of our campaigns pertaining to free expression. But as you did also mention, we are working on more issues. What that meant was that we had to implement the very same sort of scheme onto our other issues. So we are working on access issues as well as privacy. Now the key point here that we've learned is one of the sort of one of the guiding principles in establishing those additional pyramids was that all the levels are comparable on all three pyramids. It means that if someone takes a level two action on either of their three pillars, they are sort of on the same type of engagement. What are you tracking then? The, what you're tracking focuses is not the supporters, it's the type of the supporter and the type of an action that they take. Now, depending on your organization, you may end up with seven, 12, 15 pyramids. Who knows, depending on how many actions you run. So, how do you then implement this engagement scheme onto your, power, onto your entire organization? You soon realize that if you have those pyramids set up in a comparable way, where each level sort of corresponds, and you have those types of engagement, you know, 
charged out on all of those campaigns, you realize that as people ascend the pyramid, whichever one they ascend, they're all sort of moving towards the center. What you then end up with having is the most highly and the most valuable supporters are naturally moving towards the center. They're they are participating in you know higher higher barrier actions, donating, filling out you know the crowdsource tool. That takes time. That's participation. People are investing their time and money, and that is why it is important to uh, establish what we call the core. So the core is demarcated, and we've sort of been. Uh, we define our core as levels four and five, so that's level leading and owning. Uh, we include one-time donors, volunteers, people who dedicate their time, people who are very passionate. Why are we trying to sort of separate them out of the rest? It's because they deserve better, different treatment. Those are people who are much more likely to donate. How likely? I'll, I'll talk about it a bit. And uh, they're also, you know, now that when they enter that zone, they are much more likely to receive communication from us. The communication is also much more personal. Uh, and that's why it's important. Now, the resemblance to a radioactive symbol is purely accidental. <laughs> but uh, if you if you want to, you know, explain it to avoid computer, don't explain it to your colleagues. I suggest you print it out and make a model. As uh, if I can just show that. It actually it doesn't look like a radioactive symbol, but rather as a as a well, that's the thing. It's no longer a pyramid. Uh, now we are dealing with a cone um, or a mountain. Or uh, however, however you would like to talk about it, um, and so we'd like to leave you with a few lessons that we've learned over this process. Uh, things that took us a long time to figure out, but lessons that we are quite excited and happy to share with you. First of all, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to define your core. When you are trying to ask people to for very high barrier actions, become monthly allies, volunteer. You all know that you are burning your list with all those people unsubscribed because they are not ready for that kind of ask. That's why people who are in the core exhibit 21, time, 21 times higher chances of becoming monthly allies than people who are outside of that core, on average. Those are, what, what that means is that when you email those people with the monthly ask, not only they don't really unsubscribe because they are so invested in the organization, they're also much more likely to become allies. So that's, um, that's the thing. And, and uh, what the 20 versus 50 person number means is that many of you are focusing on how to grow your list. And since we launched this campaign, or since we launched this model in December of last year, since then our list grew by 20%. But our core grew by 50%. Which means that we've been really trying to focus our attention on how to move people into the core. And we've been quite succeeding. Because it does pay off, it does pay off uh, quite significantly. Even re in regard to the survey that uh, that Rana talked about, people who take the survey versus the people who actually share the survey and participated in the are on the leaderboard. Those people on the leaderboard have six times higher chances of becoming donors and getting more and more engaged in the organization. Now, one thing that I that sort of is implied in the multi pyramidal structure. <laughs> is that people can move around. So you engage people, you know, they enter your list around issue pertaining to, let's say, privacy or free expression. But then they may be suddenly interested in going to a campaign about privacy and suddenly they take action on a different pillar. And now you have a situation where you have a four directional movement on the pyramid. So not only are people moving up on the one pyramid where they were, but say it's free expression. So they took a survey, then they shared it. And they donated to this campaign, so that's the upward movement. They can now also be, be bridged, as we call it, being bridged onto other pyramids. Now, bridging turns out to be quite a good thing to do. Because when you look at the sort of mountain structure, think about less as a pyramid but more as a mountain, what you end up with is, is uh, you should not be forcing people to ascend in the, you know, in the sort of hardest way up. You should allow them to choose whether they want to go up or perhaps around. So they maybe want to, may not be ready to become donors on one pillar, but when they explore the rest of the mountain, around the top of me makes sense. But <coughs> the idea is that there is a there is a sort of a horizontal movement. Finally, you should allow people to fall off your pyramid or to sort of disappear from there. You should, it should not be a stagnant thing. Um, the criteria for us is people are inactive. And in, within the last two months, then we start counting them as being on the pyramid. 
they may re-enter at some point if they take a new action, open an email, but if they don't, then we lost them. And the third thing, <coughs> iterate. Focus on what you can accomplish, start with one pyramid, experiment, every organization has different needs, depending on whatever your issue is, you may have to modify the levels, we had to you know, eliminate one of the levels, it was the following one, because it simply didn't make sense for us in our online list management and environment. Once you figure that out, you can imply it across the whole, the whole organization. And the third one is where that's where we are currently operating. The purpose of that is to try to track the different types of moments on the engagement pyramid. <coughs> uh, and so you realize that although we are here, you're here to talk about the engagement pyramid, uh, the idea of engagement is less of a sort of structural list management where you're trying to sort of push people into specific campaigns. It's much more of a journey that you offer to your supporters to take. You shouldn't be forcing them, you should be allowing them as many options for engaging as possible. And so the question then becomes, what might your engagement think look like? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Well, you guys have set a world record. You still have like two and a half minutes left. Yeah. So you should ask some questions because you're not always going to get people this smart in the room with you. So I would take advantage of it. Yeah, so one quick point about iterating. I mean, when we first started trying to model the pyramid, we tried to have all six levels. We were going to track people who like saw something on Facebook. We were going to try to track people who visited our website but didn't engage further. Those are all good ideas that we'll, we'll hopefully implement at some point. But when we looked at doing something that was at that level of complexity at that time, it just wasn't going to be possible. But instead of scrapping the whole approach, we just started with what we could do and then we built more onto it and iterated. So that's really, really important. You know, what can you do right now, even if it's just to have two levels or three, uh, and start looking at those. Yeah, Siobhan. Right, isn't this all you're tracking? Like, is this like a staff of a million? <laughs> <laughs> it's all the way tech. All the time? Yeah. Um, yeah. Outsourcing options for dumb charities? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no one touch me. Um, <laughs> you definitely. You definitely need uh, you, you need data intelligence, so you need someone who's tapped to do that. I think there are external consultants who can probably help you with that. Um, but if you're going to get serious about this, you need at least a halftime person devoted to it. I know, but it really it really really pays off. So if you look at our email deliverability, just from Voitex saying that we should let people leave the pyramid, so we shouldn't keep trying to email them when clearly it was getting flagged as spam. You can see our action rates have already improved really dramatically just from listening to the data intelligence that he brought in the room. There's a question over there. Yeah, and we're a, we're a staff of only 10, and we've prioritized this. Are there templates or you know, basic tools that you can access that you can provide? Uh, there, there's a, uh, Groundwire has a, still has resources about the pyramid of engagement, and there are definitions of it. If you Google engagement pyramid, you'll find them, defining what it is. Yeah, but uh, it, the point is that what we ended up with, that sort of scheme that was on the second last slide, that really is particular to our organization's needs, and that's what we needed to identify. We realized that it, for us it's really important to know when people take action on more than one billing. So if they have you know, done free expression, for us to be able to bridge them, because one, so for example, the core, we define that if you take actions across all three pillars, you automatically enter the core and you become sort of that cradle of frame of our list. Now we grew that group by 50%, so I said on Christmas, but we also increased the number of conversions in terms of donations and become monthly donors because we've been much more focused on others and those people rather than on people who may not yet be ready to be sort of that high. There's a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how, how much your supporters know about where they are on the group, or, or at all? Yeah, well, at the moment they don't, really. Um, this is very much more, very much internal. But I'm sure as we speak, we're trying to develop a way that would allow supporters to know sort of what the next step is. So let's say you take a petition, you fill out a petition, and then you're on the thank you page. Usually you're asked to share something that is a level of engagement, but usually doesn't push you really high up. You're perhaps asked to donate. 
what we are trying to figure out is what is the optimal way of you know, pointing people in the right direction where it says, well, you did the survey, mm. or you, you, know, you took the action, you're obviously interested in the issue. Well, actually, not only you're stopping something that's happening, you also are being proactive, and here is a tool that's very much engaging, that allows you to voice an opinion, and that pushes you up the level of the pyramid. Yeah. To degree we can do that, it's, it's hard to do this. If you're in a digital action team or you're a market donor, you know. So if you're in those owning categories, you've self-selected and you identify, you've communicated to in that way. And really, the you other should. Side, you should become a monthly donor. It's so easy. <laughs> you should become a monthly donor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you're in the other levels, yeah, we're just figuring out how do we provide paths for those people. So I hate to shut this down because actually I think this is basically the most important discussions you can have in any kind of advocacy organization. But I have to end it, and I'm really, really sorry. But surely there's a way we can learn more from you guys. There must be like courses you're offering, trainings, workshops. There must be a way. <laughs> well, the next thing that we're doing is uh, Can Roots at the Museum of Vancouver on the 23rd and 24th of May. And we're going to get in a little bit deeper about the relative value of moving people up one issue versus bridging them between. So it'll be a little bit deeper than this. Um, but otherwise, you know, these conversations start to need to be pretty tailored for your organization. So if that's something that people are interested in, then you can get in touch with us and we'll talk from there.